there are questions about those coming across the border from Mexico. We take a look at what's being done to test and vaccinate migrants for COVID. And it's Rail Safety Week. Coming up, how you can stay safe near train tracks. Curling in Arizona? This local curling team tries to sweep their way to the Beijing Olympics. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Raven Payne. And I'm Rudy Cavazos. Thank you for joining us. Tomorrow, the results of the 2020 Maricopa County election audit will be presented at a hearing at the Arizona Senate. Democrats and Republicans have been anticipating the results for months. We talked to a number of people about their concerns. Nearly a full year after the 2020 election, contractors from the firm Cyber Ninjas will present results from their long-awaited audit of Maricopa County ballots. In a press conference, Democratic leaders across the country say they fear the results will continue to feed voter fraud theories and encourage suppression laws even after previous audit results were released from the Arizona Senate. These unproven allegations of widespread voter fraud have become the basis for voter suppression laws that have historically been used to target and disenfranchise black and brown voters, poor voters, older voters, and people with disabilities. Many Republicans are also concerned about an audit that could undermine the election process and encourage people not to vote. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy over a period of time, and it does undermine the credibility of, of um, democracy. Um, and it's a, it's a cancerous theory. Coughlin believes the audit is an effort for some Republicans to keep former President Trump's name relevant. Democrats say no matter what the results turn out to be, the audit still sets a dangerous precedent. The presentation of the audit findings is at 1 p.m. Friday at the state Senate chambers. It will also be live streamed. Cronkite News will have a team of reporters covering the hearing and will have coverage tomorrow night. As the highly contagious Delta variant continues infecting people, some say migrants are responsible for COVID-19 surges. Cronkite News reporter Samantha Bird explains what's being done at the border. Several governors in the South are blaming migrants for the increase in coronavirus numbers. That is a lie. The virus is worldwide. We are not spreading the virus. Euridia Pimentel says she feels disappointed to hear negative comments about migrants. She is in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, and hopes to get a chance to live in the United States. What about the people coming from there? They could have it as well. Mayor of Yuma, Douglas Nichols, says he doesn't believe Mexicans or other immigrants are responsible for the COVID increase. Like the movement of any population, they could be bringing with them uh, some COVID or, or, or that, but I don't think it's the dominant uh, exposure. In San Luis, Arizona, the Regional Center for Border Health provides COVID tests for migrants who cross the border. We agree and co coordinate um, the releases with us. So we've been testing all the migrants. They are released to us. Um, and, uh, and we have a very small number, less than 2% of positivity rate. Amanda Aguirre, president of Border Health, says they make sure that migrants entering Arizona are free of COVID. We have a lot of stakeholders uh, looking after the, the process of the migrant coming into this country, making sure that they make a safe trip to wherever they go, and also seeing the operation of our operation, how fast it is that we take, take care of the migrants to get them into the, their um, to get them into the final destination. In Yuma, Samantha Bird, Cronkite News. The state is reporting 69 new COVID-related deaths today. Just over 3,000 new cases were reported and more than 11,800 new vaccine doses administered. State health officials rejected a request this week to expand the surge line to those with non-COVID-related illness. The surge line is a call-in system that helps find beds for COVID-19 patients in critical condition. The CDC is also reporting that 99.9% .9 of Santa Cruz County's eligible population is now vaccinated. Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport dropped to fifth place in J.D. Power's 2021 North America Airport Satisfaction Study. Sky Harbor actually performed better than it did in 2020 when it led the nation in airport satisfaction. Researchers say the data reflects changing expectations among travelers. Early in the pandemic, passengers were satisfied with any shop or restaurant being open but now they expect full service at the airport. Miami International Airport topped this year's list. The director of Sky Harbor says that the Arizona Coyotes proposed stadium could impact air travel. 
In the past, sporting venues haven't been built in Tempe because of the airport. The proposed venue would only be about 1.8 miles away from the end of the airport's runway. This close proximity can cause issues for the airport. For example, spotlights and lasers can create navigational problems. Arizona is ranked 14th in pedestrian rail trash pass casualties. We look at why these numbers are so high and how to stay safe. And when we come back, where one of Arizona's largest utilities is building a new solar plant. Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. For the first time ever, our most popular programs have been selected just for you. But there's so much more. Whether you like to travel. Wow. Feast. Mmm. And calories don't count. <laughs> look back. That is me. Discover. You know the whole story. There's something for everyone. Let's get to it right away. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app. What you get from Washington Week that you will not get anywhere else are the best and the brightest reporters from different media companies, and they're able to have a real conversation about things that are happening in Washington and around the country. But it's also a show about issues that are relevant to different communities. How do you think that As the moderator, I feel this deep responsibility to bring in those other perspectives so that people understand how power and politics impact their daily lives. Friday nights at 7 on Arizona PBS. Cronkite News provides students at ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism with the opportunity to gain real-world experience in the newsroom. At Cronkite News, our students produce professional content for audiences by taking on all roles, whether they be reporting, anchoring, producing, or studio production. Each department gives students first-hand professional newsroom experience. For more information, visit cronkitenews.azpbs.org. It's Rail Safety Week, and according to the Federal Railroad Administration, Arizona has some of the highest rail trespass casualties in the country. Cronkite News reporter Carolina Hassett tells us why these numbers are so high. The Federal Railroad Administration reported over 1,000 pedestrian rail casualties in 2020, 22 of those from right here in Arizona. This ranked Arizona number 14 in the country for total rail trespass casualties. The faint sound of a bell. A sound that alerts many people about approaching trains. However, not everyone hears the warning, causing many trespass accidents, especially with pedestrians. People with handheld devices, they're focusing on what's in front of them and not where they're walking. Farler says since so many of Arizona's trains are located in urban areas, the state is seeing an increase in pedestrian trespass casualties. Cities are growing in metropolitan areas near railroad tracks. And the light rail system runs through some of the most congested areas of the state. We operate in uh, a very busy part of the valley in Phoenix, Mesa, and Tempe. And what we see is sometimes people not uh, following the traffic signals. While the light rail system here in the valley experiences few fatalities, the system shares the road with many vehicles. Valley Metro has safety measures in place to decrease fatalities in collisions. Our trains have a big bumper and they're designed to kind of push a car away from them. So that's why we don't really experience those fatalities or major injuries when those collisions occur. Safety measures like these seem to be working. According to the Operation Lifesaver website, there has been an 82% decline in train motor vehicle collisions. We've seen a reduction in all vehicle collisions throughout the years and that's because of great separations in education. Casualties are very tragic. I think there just needs to be people paying attention, more information, education, and just following the rules and that's what's going to help keep us all safe. Experts encourage the community to remember that an encounter with any kind of rail system can be very serious. Trains are a lot bigger than you are, so if you get struck by one of those trains, you're in peril for your vehicle and for your life. When it's a train versus a person, the train's going to win every time. Some other safety tips from Arizona Operation Lifesaver include staying behind the yellow lines when preparing to enter a rail car, using patience when at railroad crossings, and always being aware of your surroundings. In the newsroom, Carolina Hassett, Cronkite News.
A bipartisan group of lawmakers is renewing efforts to expand a federal compensation program for those exposed to radiation during the Cold War. The legislation would add to the list of sites across the West affected by fallout and radiation exposure. It would also increase potential compensation to $150,000 and provide coverage to additional forms of cancer. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez called it a matter of justice. An Arizona water and power utility announced its plans to build a new solar plant near Flagstaff. Salt River Project says construction on the CO Bar solar plant is expected to begin in 2023. The plant may deliver enough energy to power 80,000 homes and offset 1 billion pounds of carbon dioxide emissions annually. The company says with the CO Bar power plant and others, nearly 50% of energy delivered to SRP customers could come from carbon-free sources by 2025. The plan is scheduled to be commercially operational in 2024. It's the last week of the monsoon and it's still hot in the valley. Alyssa Stoney is in the Weather Center and gives us an update on what we can expect in the coming days. Yes, this week marks the last official week of monsoon season and yesterday marked the first official day of fall. But let's talk about what that means for us here in Arizona. Tomorrow, our highs, you can be expecting around 95 degrees in Phoenix. Throughout the western part of our state, we're going to be in those 90s as well. And in the northern part, we'll be a little bit cooler at 73 degrees in Flagstaff and 77 degrees in Payson. Now, along with that monsoon season, we may be seeing a couple storms moving throughout the state this weekend. They're mostly going to be affecting the southern part of the state, but here in Phoenix, we may get a little wind and rain here and there. Now taking a look at what your evening is going to look like by sunset, we're going to be about 93 degrees with cloud coverage throughout the night and a slight chance for rain across the valley. Now looking at your weekend, we're going to be cooler than normal. We're going to be about 93 degrees on Saturday and only 86 degrees on Sunday with a 20% chance of storms throughout the weekend. Now looking at the rest of next week, we're going to be having lower temperatures with highs at only 93 on Tuesday and 91 on Wednesday and Thursday with a 10% chance of storms throughout the week. Now I guess that's what fall means for us here in Phoenix. In the Weather Center, Alyssa Stoney, Cronkite News. I'm Jack Johnson. Coming up after the break, I'll have your Cronkite Sports Report. Up next, an Arizona high school garners national attention after a heroic comeback with just one minute left in the game. Every day I wake up, my first thought is how can I serve this community? The biggest hurdle was not taking PTSD personally. Would you welcome, please, the amazing. Everybody that watches me, they say that I am the greatest that they've ever seen. I was so excited when I learned that I was going to be the next moderator of Washington Week. I was incredibly lucky to be mentored by Gwen Eiffel. And what that gave to me was this confidence that I could be my full self and that I was deserving in whatever spaces I was in. Welcome to Washington Week. I also feel this great joy in taking the helm of Washington Week, knowing that I can mold it and make it my own, but also make sure that it is still within the legacy and the tradition that made it so great for all of these years. Your favorite member benefit is getting better and bigger. This is wonderful. Over the next year, Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. They give us all that they've got. From your favorite cooking and travel series. Even the stairs are breathtaking. To history specials and award-winning documentaries. Better and bigger. That really is the fun part. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app. It's prime time on your time. Watch Prime Afternoons every weekday on Arizona PBS. Did you miss a show in the evening? Then catch up on Prime Afternoons. Your favorite dramas. No more bloody heroics. Antiques Roadshow. Really? <laughs> Nature and Nova. It's time to reintroduce some wonder into this miracle of nature. All of the best from PBS on Prime Afternoons. Weekdays starting at 1.30, only on Arizona PBS. And welcome back. I'm Jack Johnson, and here is your Cronkite Sports Report. 
Hamilton High School made national headlines last Friday after pulling off a major comeback in just the final minute of their nationally televised game. The Huskies beat the seventh ranked team in the country, Bishop Gorman. But if you ask the team, it was nothing they couldn't handle. Cronkite News reporter Jackson Coppinger tells us how Hamilton gives a new meaning to the cliche, one play at a time. Hamilton High School is one of the elite football programs in the state, but the Huskies found themselves in a near impossible situation, down 17 points with less than two minutes left in the game. But the team believed they still had a chance. Everything we did in the game is everything we've been doing since spring ball. So it's nothing that we haven't done. It, it just, we had to execute in the game. Hamilton's kicker, Jacob Medina, received the special teams player of the game for the two recovered onside kicks that ultimately put the Huskies in position to win. Medina said it was all just a part of the job. I just kept thinking of what my coaches have been talking to me since the beginning of the year. Stick to your craft, believe in yourself, and just do your job. After Medina helped his offense get the ball back for the second straight time, they saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Like I knew we were going to win it. I knew it well, as soon as we returned it. Hamilton has had their share of nationally broadcasted games as recently as just last year, and it's safe to say that experience paid off. They understood the TV timeouts. They understood uh, all the extra cameras, all the extra people, um, and, and the type of uh, environment that we were going to play in. And uh, I, I believe that you know playing in those two games last year um, really helped us, you know, maintain our composure and our cool. And this cool comeback was one for the history books. In Chandler, Jackson Coppinger, Cronkite News. And games like that do not come around very often, which makes it even more fun for the announcers. ESPN analyst Bobby Carpenter admits he did not think Hamilton could win the game. The odds of them recovering two onside kicks were, of course, slim to none. But when the spotlight was on the Huskies' Jacob Medina, Carpenter had fun with the kicker's name, referencing the 80s rapper Tone Loke. His name was phenomenal because Medina, I mean, how often do you say in the kicker's name? He had one extra point and then the kickoff on the opening drive. And then we really didn't, we didn't talk about him until the last minute of the game when he's kicking a field goal. And all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, Medina, I'm like, put some funky comedine on that ball. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. And we have playoff basketball tonight with the Mercury hosting the New York Liberty in a single game elimination matchup. The Mercury may be without team leader Diana Taurasi, who has been out of the lineup since earlier this month. One player who has filled that hole is Bria Hartley. A former member of the Liberty, Hartley is expected to face against a familiar foe. New York is one of the teams I'd rather play. It's like playing against your hometown. I just think you got a little extra, extra, extra um, intensity going into a game like that. So um, I can't wait, and I can't wait to see how it goes tomorrow. That game was good in, in you know just to be able to see Bria get more and more comfortable with the extended minutes, and, and you saw what she could do. I thought she was really productive in the game against Vegas. The game is set to tip off tonight at 7 on ESPN2. If the Mercury win, they will take on the Seattle Storm in the second round. And Arizona isn't exactly a hotbed for Olympic curlers, but one local team made a push to Beijing. Cronkite sports reporter Andrea Aguilera has more on the uncommon journey these curlers took through the Olympic trials. For Team Sagan's of Tempe, there was one benefit to COVID-19 getting a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to compete in the Olympic Trial Series, the first team from Arizona to take part in the competition. When they froze the world rankings due to COVID, we, we got our invitation while literally sitting on the couch. Being from the desert, there isn't a whole lot of opportunity for, for people to have done it before us. With the rink closed due to the pandemic, the odds were stacked against Team Siggins, but the curlers knew they couldn't pass up the chance to try and make the Olympics. Mike wanted to go and I talked, helped talk the other two guys into going because the experience is something you only get once, you know, once in every four years. Who knows how long you're going to have that opportunity and, uh, and they're good enough to be there. Although Team Siggins ended their Olympic dream run, their dreams to continue in the sport remain at this facility. We all want to wear a USA on our back. That's kind of the dream that we all have. And maybe one day, these curlers from Arizona can sweep their way into the Olympic Games. In Tempe, Andrea Aguilera, Cronkite News. Finally today, Tori Lovello is staying in the Diamondbacks dugout for now.
The D-backs gave the 56-year-old manager a one-year contract extension with a team option through 2023. Lovello has been at the helm since 2017, but the team has struggled this year and may be on track to post their worst record in franchise history with just 10 games remaining. And that does it for this Cronkite Sports Report. Rudy and Raven, let's go back to you. What would it look like if humans lived on the surface of the moon or Mars? What project researchers at the University of Arizona are doing to simulate this idea when we come back. Every day I wake up, my first thought is, how can I serve this community? The biggest hurdle was not taking PTSD personally. Would you welcome, please, the amazing. Everybody that watches me, they say that I am the greatest that they've ever seen. I was so excited when I learned that I was going to be the next moderator of Washington Week. I was incredibly lucky to be mentored by Gwen Ifill, and what that gave to me was this confidence that I could be my full self and that I was deserving in whatever spaces I was in. Welcome to Washington Week. I also feel this great joy in taking the helm of Washington Week, knowing that I can mold it and make it my own, but also make sure that it is still within the legacy and the tradition that made it so great for all of these years. Your favorite member benefit is getting better and bigger. This is wonderful. Over the next year, Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. They give us all that they've got. From your favorite cooking and travel series. Even the stairs are breathtaking. To history specials and award-winning documentaries. Better and bigger. That really is the fun part. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app. It's prime time on your time. Watch Prime Afternoons every weekday on Arizona PBS. Did you miss a show in the evening? Then catch up on Prime Afternoons. Your favorite dramas. No more bloody heroics. Antiques Roadshow. Really? <laughs> Nature and Nova. It's time to reintroduce some wonder into this miracle of nature. All of the best from PBS on Prime Afternoons. Weekdays starting at 1.30, only on Arizona PBS. Researchers at the University of Arizona are refurbishing a part of Biosphere 2 to see what life might look like when humans live on the surface of the moon or Mars. Cronkite News reporter Nick Shesky sat down with team leaders and to discuss the SAM project and living on the red planet. 30 years ago, the test module near Tucson was home to the original eight Biospherians who tried to live completely sealed from the outside world in a bioregenerative experiment with all of their air, water, and food produced and recycled by plants. But now, the module is home to a new project, looking to the future of our species. There's something really powerful about becoming an interplanetary species and bringing life with us where we go to explore. In 2019, the test module had no experiments and no purpose. It laid at Biosphere 2 unused and abandoned. That was until Kai Stott spotted it when he was taking a tour of Biosphere 2. But it had been grown over and there's weeds and cactus and rats and uh, both dead and alive. <laughs> and, and I said to John, I said, what is this? What, what are you going to do with it? And he says, well, that's the original prototype. We haven't done anything with it for, for almost you know, 30 years. And he says, if you can find use for it, it's yours. Stotts found a purpose and named it SAM, a space analog for the moon and Mars. Think of an analog as a station that sort of simulates what it would be like to live on a foreign planet. Stotts and the rest of his team spent most of this year refurbishing the test module into a Mars analog that they hope can lead to lots of findings about living on the Martian surface. When you put somebody into a sealed environment, it changes the game across the board. It's no longer just camping. You're actually inside of this building and everything you do, every breath you take, everything you drink, everything you eat, all of that stays in the environment. 
Last June, Stotts, Trent Tresh, and three others were sealed inside SAM for over four hours to measure things like temperature, pressure, humidity, and carbon dioxide levels. One of the core objectives of SAM is to be the first Mars analog to clean air not by using CO2 scrubbers, but by solely using plants. We're not going to want to rely entirely on mechanical devices. We're going to want to transition into functional greenhouses, which are called controlled environments. And long term, we're going to want to grow our own food on Mars. And why not have the plants draw down that CO2 as well? They need CO2. We produce CO2. It's a good relationship. Now, Sam is not the only astronaut analog out there. There have been a dozen astronaut analogs all across the world on every continent but none of them have tried to go to the extremes of a completely sealed environment like Sam is trying to do. Analog astronautics are, I mean, they're popping up everywhere. People want to get out there and train to be astronauts. They want to uh, create tools to be used on their planets. And, you know, they need facilities to test those things in a, uh, you know, proper research methods. So I see Sam as a huge springboard to support the future of humanity in space. 30 years after the original Biospherians left the test module, Stotts, Tresh, and the rest of the team are daring to once again seal themselves away from the outside world to show that maybe one day humans on Mars will live like the Biospherians tried to 30 years ago. If humans ever settle on the Martian surface, it might not look identical to the SAM project, but there is no doubt in the minds of Stotts and Tresh that SAM will be a huge help in sustaining settlements on the Moon and Mars for a long time. In the studio, Nick Shesky, Cronkite News. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.